tonight, I have the opportunity to continue in this series and answer one of the questions that you asked. So if you have your Bible, your actual Bible or your phone, turn to Acts 9. We're going to read verses 1 through 18. I have my physical Bible, which is actually hardcover. Um, I don't know many people that have a hardcover Bible, but my friend from YouTube had one, and so I bought it on Amazon because I thought it was cute. And honestly, maybe if I threw my Bible at the devil, it would hurt him a little more because it's hardcover. Maybe you've had enough time to turn to Acts 9. So Acts 9, verses 1 through 18. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, which is what Christians were referred to at that time, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man And all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. The question that I am addressing tonight is, what is my purpose. Let's pray. God, we just thank you, Lord, that we are here tonight. God, we know that you want to move in our lives, that you have a purpose and a plan that goes beyond anything we can understand and imagine. So God, I just pray that our hearts would be open tonight to receive your word and our minds would not be easily distracted, but that we would take the next few moments to just focus on who you are, your goodness and your faithfulness, that you would allow the spirit to guide us and lead us, to guide me and guide my words, Lord that you would just show up tonight and show us more of who you are. We thank you, we praise you, and in Jesus' name, everybody said? Everybody said? Come on, let's give God one more shout of praise. I think that's um, what's so interesting about purpose is even from when we're kids, it's all about purpose. When you're a little kid, they ask you, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? Then you go into um, high school, and it's like, well, where are you going to go to college? What are you going to study? Then you get to college, and it's like, what is your major, and what are you going to do? And so our lives just revolve a lot around this word, this idea of purpose. What is my purpose? And I think that um, at one point in everyone's lives, we get to this place where we're like, where, what is my purpose? What is my purpose? What am I called to do? What am I meant to do? And I think that the story of Paul tonight is going to kind of help us and guide us in um, this question that we always ask of purpose. And as I was studying and kind of um, meditating, and especially in the life of Paul, I found that there's three different layers of purpose 
And sometimes we focus on one more than the other, but I believe that tonight um, God is going to guide us and lead us in kind of shifting our perspective and bringing our priorities back in order. And so typically, when we think of purpose, we think of vocation. What is my career? What am I going to work in? What am I going to do? And um, I think that many of us can relate to Paul. How many of us in the room thought we were going to do one thing, but are completely going in a different direction? We thought we were going to be a lawyer. We thought we were going to be a doctor. We thought we were going to have uh, kids and be married by now, but that's not the case. (laughs) Or many of us have maybe pursued a degree and we're not even working in that field. Anyone else? I pursued my degree firstly um, in pre-law and then I changed it to liberal studies and then I changed it again to psychology and now I do nothing with psychology. I'm in full-time ministry and even after I graduated, I was a realtor for two years, then I was a preschool teacher for two years and so sometimes we are in that place where we're going back and forth and we're trying to figure out What is my purpose? What am I supposed to do? What job am I supposed to take? And maybe some of us have taken 10 jobs and we still don't know. And um, it reminds me of my little sister. I have two younger sisters. One is 19 now, Natalie, and the other one is Sophie. She's 12. And when Natalie was seven, she, like I said, when since you're little, they're like, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do? And um, so she was kind of in that phase in her life. And she came up to us one day and said, I am going to be a dog groomer. She was so passionate, so excited. I want to be a dog groomer. We're like, okay, well, why? She's like, well, I want to play with puppies all day. I just want to, you know, pet them and play with them. And we're like, okay, well, you know that when you're a dog groomer, you have to actually groom the dog. You have to cut its hair, cut its nails, clean its ears, clean all parts of the dog, cute or ugly, big or small, you got to groom the dog. And she was like, okay, no, I I don't want to do that. So she came back a week later and she's like, I've got it now. I've been inspired. I've watched it. I know what I want to do. I just finished watching Ice Princess. I'm going to be an ice skater. She's like, their outfits are cute. Their makeup is on point. And they just do these beautiful spins. We're like, okay, well, you know, to be an ice skater, you have to skate on ice. You have to learn how to skate and you have to, you know, it's not just all glam. And she was like, okay, well, nope, don't want to do that. So she's like, okay, I'm going to take another week. So she came back another week and she's like, I've got it. I'm going to be Hannah Montana. I'm going to sing and perform and act and it's going to be amazing. We're like, hey, great. But you know, you have to actually know how to sing You have to actually know how to dance and perform, and you got to go in front of people. And she was like, okay, no, I'm not doing that. And although she was seven at the time and since then has figured out what she wants to do, we can find ourselves being a little bit like Natalie. Like, well, I thought I was going to do this one thing. And then I kind of got into that area of um, expertise or that job. And it's not what I thought it was going to be. I didn't know that I had to put in that work. I didn't know I had to do that amount of work. And so sometimes we can feel like her. We've changed our minds so many times that we're at this place as what is the point? What is the purpose of having this job? And what I believe tonight is that there is purpose in your vocation, in where you want to work, but your work, your vocation does not define your purpose. That there is a purpose in the work that you do, but it doesn't define your purpose. And in Acts 18, we actually learn that Paul was a tent maker. He was a tent maker, and even after his conversion, the story that we just read, he continued to be a tent maker. And although he was making tents, that's not what we remember him by. 
A lot of the times when we talk about Paul, when we talk about his story, we refer to the encounter he had with Jesus and how he went out into the world and preached about him and got people to know more about who Jesus is. That's what we remember Paul as. So we tend to focus a lot on this vocation. What am I going to do? What am I going to be? But honestly, and we'll touch on that a little later, but it's more of who you are. And so um, I still believe that we need to work, right? We need to eat. We need to pay our bills. So we need to work. But sometimes we may tend to think that the excuse is, well, there's no purpose in what I'm actually doing. What is the purpose of working at McDonald's or working this overnight shift as a security? Or maybe you're just where you don't want to be. Or maybe you don't know where you want to be because you see the bigger picture. But can I tell you that you're making a difference? That wherever you are, wherever you're working, it's making a difference. And the difference I think you're making is that you are on mission. I have a friend that a couple years ago, he joined the Marines. And uh, for eight weeks, he had this intensive boot camp. He couldn't communicate with any of his family. He couldn't um, eat most of the time. I think they had like meals in a bag or something like that. And the last week, they really trained them. They disciplined, they developed them, and they trained them for deployment. And I think some of us may be in our workplace right now to be disciplined, developed, and trained for your deployment. But I think a lot of us right now are in our deployment. And what's funny Um, Deployment is usually referred to as something with the military, right? You're sent out or whatever it is. But what um, I found interesting is when I looked up the definition of deployment, it says assigning people to serve in various locations, especially soldiers and other military personnel. It's a word used for people that are being sent somewhere for a specific mission. And so what I believe tonight is that everyone in this room has been deployed to where they are right now for a specific mission, for a specific purpose, to bring more people to Jesus through his soldiers. Did you know that you and I are soldiers? That we are the soldiers for God, that we can go into a workplace and define the purpose, that you don't need to wait for a a definition of purpose. You are the purpose. It's already in you. And so we tend to focus a lot on, well, what's the purpose? What's the purpose? You are the purpose, exactly where you are. Paul had two reasons for being a tent maker after he was following Jesus. One, to fund his ministry but also to to reach people that he could probably never reach if he wasn't out there making tents. And so I believe wherever you are right now, people would not know who Jesus is if you were not there. That there may be no one else on that shift that you are working that knows Jesus and that could show people who Jesus truly is. And so we get really worked up on our job title. Well, what is my job title? What is my job position? Where should I be? You are where you need to be. And I believe that um, if we focus way too much on what to do next, you're going to miss what you need to do right now. And if you do not steward what you have today, you will never get to where you want to be. And so I think that we can define the purpose in our workplace and that that's going to take some shift uh, in our perspective or in our mind. But I believe that we can do it. And I also believe that that plays into the second layer of purpose, which is calling. Our calling, and I think that calling goes way deeper than where we work. I believe that it actually comes secondary to our vocation. And it's it's a call to belong to Christ and to participate in his redemption of the world. And the way that we participate in that redemption is through what Jesus commanded us to do. Matthew 28, 18, uh, verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, 
Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So I believe that yeah, we, we focus a lot on our vocation, but this second part, this calling, is something that we really need to prioritize. That you, your, your calling is so important to where your life is going to head. And so the mission, the command goes to a deeper level of discipleship. I don't believe that God just wants converts. To Christianity. I think that we need to train people to mentor them, to be um, followers of Jesus that will faithfully uh, follow him and lead others to him. So that's why I think it comes secondary to what our vocation is because your calling will never change. Wherever you are, your calling will never change. Your vocation might. You may be, you know, uh, working at one place or maybe you'll be a doctor and then you'll change to something else. But your vocation may change. Your calling never will. Your calling to reach more people will never change. The people may, but that call will not. And so to have um, this as our priority is really important. And honestly, no one here wants to do life alone. Deep down, you do not want to do life alone. And there's people all over this room that may feel a little alone. And that's kind of why I love um, connect groups, because it's an opportunity to um, just meet with people. It's a small group. We meet weekly. We pour into each other's lives. But it's also an opportunity not only to get discipled, but the opportunity to disciple. And so some of us here tonight may need to be discipled. We, need, we may need to learn a few other things or be trained in different areas of our lives. And so connect groups are so important because it is that opportunity to fulfill that God, the call that God has placed in our lives. And I believe that as you join connect groups, you're going to find freedom and get discipled, have the opportunity to disciple so that you can fulfill the call that God has placed in your life. That we're not supposed to do this alone. That we need to grab other people around us. And in 1 Timothy 2, 4, God's desire is for all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He wants to use you and I as vessels to show people who Jesus is in our families, in our workplace, in our community, in our cities, because as we link together, we will make a bigger difference. And so I believe as we follow this call, we will find what our purpose is on a deeper level. That our purpose is not only found in what we work in, but what our call is to walk out this life with other people, to disciple them, to build them up. We live in a world where everybody's against each other, right? You look on Instagram or the news and everything is in a battle. Everything is in a fight. Do we really want to be a part of that? We don't like it done to us. So we just got to really pick up people along the way and just bring them on this journey. And so later we find in Paul's story that he had a couple disciples. He had a couple people that he walked alongside with. Um, first it was Barnabas, then Silas, then Timothy. And I believe that Paul didn't really focus on what his vocation was because he was a tent maker. But um, he really fulfilled this part of his life as his calling and discipled some guys, uh, Barnabas, Timothy, and Silas. And we're going to really um, learn how that affected and changed his life. And so the third layer that I want to kind of spend some time on is identity. Identity. I believe that everything flows through our identity, who we are. And this can be difficult for a lot of us. If we're honest, if we're being true and vulnerable, we don't know who we are. Whatever age you're in, it, this could be kind of a, a soft place in your heart because we don't know who we are. And the issue with not knowing who we are is that then we find our purpose in relationships, in job titles, in your situation. 
And the thing is, whether you choose it or not, your identity is being defined either by you or the people around you. So I believe we really need to take hold of what our identity, of what our identity is. And um, for me, I struggled a lot with identity. I am a people pleaser. Any people pleasers in the room? Now, if you don't know what people pleasing is, it means that you want to please people. No matter who the person is, you want to please that person. And so sometimes you may um, kind of lower your standards depending on what the situation is. I know I found myself in that place a lot. And it's a hard place to be in because it's much more difficult to find your identity when you have found it in so many different things. It's a lot of layers that you got to peel off. It's a lot of things you got to put down. There's a lot of friendships that you'll have to cut off. There's a lot of situations that you'll have to step back from because that's not who you want to be. And I think that deep down, you know who you want to be. We want to be people that can change the world, that can encourage others, that can make a difference. And so I think that wherever you are right now, you have the opportunity to find your identity to change the way your life is going and to find purpose in who you truly are. And so let's put ourselves in Paul's shoes for just a second. So Paul was a Roman citizen and he was um, born in this town called Tarsus and he was raised as a Pharisee. Okay, he was raised, he was under one of the biggest Pharisees at the time and this is all he knew. He's out here killing Christians. Sending them to jail, no matter who it was. He was there, front row and center. It was his life. It was his purpose to do this. And then as he's on the road to Damascus with a letter from a high priest to continue doing these things, he has this encounter with God. And um, as he's doing this, can you imagine what Paul must have felt like? This was his whole life, his, his being. This is everything that he knew, and now it's completely changed. And we don't have a lot of details on those three days where he could not see, but I can imagine that the questions that he was battling was, what do I do now? What, what am I supposed to do? I thought my life was going to go this way, And now something has stopped me literally in my tracks and it's going this other way. And I think about the questions he must have asked, like, what is my purpose now? And I would even dare to say that Paul questioned, why would God even choose me? And I think we can find ourselves there sometimes. Well, I want to be this and my purpose is found in this and it's defined in this. But why would God choose me? What is my identity? What can I stand firm on? And what Paul didn't know is that um, as he's battling these questions, I'm sure, or these three days of just silence, he can't even see. There's silence. God already had a purpose for him. He already had his identity defined. And so we come to this conversation in Acts 9-10 with Ananias. And God's like, hey, Ananias, go to this house. Paul, well, Saul at the time, he's there and he knows you're coming. So just go over there and put a hand on him and pray for him. And Ananias' response is like, "Um, God, as if he doesn't know. God, do you know that Paul is out here killing your people? That he literally has a letter from the high priest giving him authority to arrest more men and women who follow you. And I love God's response. He says, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument. That God had a plan, he has a plan, that no matter what we've been through, no matter how many identities we've picked up along the way, that he has an identity for you, that he has a plan for you, that you can pick up that identity right now in this moment and your life can be changed in an instant, just like Paul. But the only way to know what that plan is 
is to know who he is and who he has called you to be. Everything will flow out of your identity. Everything. It starts at the core. Then it flows into your calling. Then it flows into your workplace. That the more you know Jesus, the more you spend time with your Savior, you will know what your calling is. You will know what your vocation is, where he wants you. He just wants you to be obedient, to know more of him. And so God chose Paul way before Paul ever chose him. But although that God chose him and Paul has this encounter with God, he still had to make a choice. He still had to make a choice to know God, to discover who he is. And because he made that decision, 20 years later, Paul could stand firm in God's faithfulness. It takes time. We don't have the details of the three years that Paul spent in Damascus before he was sent out, but I can imagine that he was truly discovering who he was because his entire purpose changed. So he needed to take some time and know what he had to do. And um, this message kind of uh, spoke to me a little bit I went through a season of trying to figure out my own identity. When I was 19, I was watching Rendezvous online. Um, I got saved online. So the power of God is not just in this building. It could go through a screen, trust me. And at the moment, I was just really struggling with who I was. I had um, found my identity in relationships, in different people, in different friendships, and I was just hanging around the wrong crowd. I was just listening to the wrong things, being a part of the wrong things. And I found myself, and I would identify myself as completely and utterly broken. I didn't know what my next step was. I thought I was going to be something that I completely was not. I went to school or went to work feeling kind of worthless, without purpose. I, I didn't have many friends. I, the friends that I did have were outside of the church. I was like, oh, my goodness, what am I supposed to do now? I'm, I guess I'm just going to be by myself. I was broken. And I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision in that moment when I felt God calling me through a screen. It was Chad Veach preaching on the five love languages. And I didn't know what love truly was. I surely did not feel loved. But I had to make a decision in that moment. And I made that decision, and I still felt broken. I still came to church sad. <laughs> I still came to church with the same problems. I still came to church with the people that I used to hang out with, saying the same things, whatever they wanted to do, but I came. And there were a lot of moments where I had to stand in worship with tears in my eyes, raising my hand, saying, okay, God, whenever you want to show me what my purpose is, I'm here. And I consistently went to God and to God and you know what? In worship is where I found my identity. In praising him and lifting him up is where I found my identity and my purpose. And what's so powerful about the story of Paul is that um, Paul and Silas ended up going and they were going to go pray and they're in this town. And as they're traveling through the streets, this woman with a spirit to predict the future is going after them. And Paul gets annoyed and he goes, okay, I cast the spirit out of you. So the spirit goes and the people were so upset because that's the hope in them making money that they took Paul and Silas to the authorities and they were thrown in prison. They're in prison. Some of us feel in prison right now. We feel trapped by our situations. We feel trapped with this battling of who we are. And so Paul and Silas are in the prison. And in the midnight hour, they're singing hymns to their God. They're worshiping their God. And the ground shook and the prison, door, the prison doors opened. 
shackles were dropped because they knew who their identity was found in. They built it on something firm. They built it on something sustainable that no matter what situation came their way, no matter where they were, they were going to lift their hands up to God. And I can identify with that. I can identify with that because although it was a struggle to find my identity, there's nothing, there's nothing that can replace that. There's nothing that can replace the identity that God gives you. That your purpose is not going to be found in your job. And some people are like, amen, I'm not going to be a burger flipper. That's not what my identity is. It's not. You're going to find it even more as you walk out your calling. But you're truly going to find something sustainable that will not shake you when you find your identity. When you find your identity in God. And I look back at 19-year-old Crystal, 20-year-old Crystal, 21-year-old Crystal, 22-year-old Crystal, 23-year-old Crystal, and 24-year-old Crystal still has to remind herself of who her identity is found in. And that my identity is not defined by my situation, but by my Savior. And I remind you tonight that He calls you worthy, that He calls you chosen, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that no weapon formed against you shall prosper, that He has a plan, a purpose, and a calling specifically for you, that you can stand firm in your situation, that you have purpose to know that you are identified as a child of God, that you are a child of the Most High King, and you can stand firm in any situation knowing that he has called you that he has a plan and a purpose for your life there was no way that 19 year old crystal could have known that she would be here today not even on the platform be here in this room but it's through finding relationship with jesus that i found my identity when I found my identity, I had the strength and the courage to walk out my calling. No matter where it is, I know what my calling is. To bring more people to Jesus, wherever I'm at. And then now I have found my vocation in full-time ministry and that may change tomorrow and that's okay because I know what my identity is. And I know whose name I can call upon and everything changes. Can we stand right now? I just want to pray over you and the worship team is going to continue to sing this song because I believe that some of us just need to lift up our hands that we need to trust that our God has a purpose and a plan even if it doesn't feel like it right now that right where you are you make the decision and your life will change forever God we just thank you Lord we thank you that you have a purpose that no matter where we are right now, God, that we can find identity in you, in something that is sustainable, in a God who is faithful, in a God who is good, no matter what our situation looks like. So I just pray right now that Holy Spirit, you would begin to talk to every person in this room, that you would specifically tell them what their purpose, their calling is, that it would not just come through my voice, but it would come through you, Holy Spirit. God, that we can call upon the name of Jesus and everything will change. Our circumstance will change. Our lives will